Oh, good morning again, everyone. Can you hear me okay? All right, awesome. I'm going to have several other people sharing along with me. So if you're not on speaker view, uh, you might want to go to speaker view so that you can see those uh, other people as they're sharing because they'll be on a little small screen and um, that might be more difficult to see. We're going to be in um, John chapter 1 and then kind of going through John and then in a few chapters in Acts. So if you have your own Bible, just get to John chapter 1 and then we're going to be, um, pardon the pun, zooming through um, John and Acts as well, telling a few different stories. So first of all, a question for you. Has anybody had a haircut lately? Anybody had a haircut? Yeah, a few of you. Um, how many people are looking forward to their next haircut? Anybody? Yeah, we got a few people as well too. Well, uh, I'm gonna. We're gonna come back to haircuts in a moment. Many of you have been uh, praying regularly for conversations um, with others as God would lead you. Remember. And if you read the email, I, I reminded you about those five people that we've been talking about uh, for you to pray for. Um, so if you've been listening and remembering and putting that into practice, then you've been doing that. We've been encouraging to read God's, read, read God's word and then asking him how he wants to apply it in your life, asking for opportunities to, uh, to share, share Jesus with your family, uh, with other believers so that you can encourage one another and build each other up. And then as God puts people in front of you um, to share a bit of your faith story or a story about Jesus or a story about God. So this morning, we're going to hear several stories from Jesus' life. And when I say stories, I mean true accounts of things that happened during, dur during his life and a little bit after as well in the church. So conversations, that's what we're going to be looking at this morning. Those are so important. They're one of the most important parts of our lives. It's pretty difficult to have a relationship without conversations. And I know that some of you have felt pretty lonely and isolated recently because of maybe not as many conversations as you would like to have. And others of you who maybe have thought that you're pretty okay without too many conversations have found out that you need more uh, than you thought you did. We all know, uh, sadly, that conversations can lead to tension and to fighting and, and to hurt in relationships, um, but over time, hopefully, we get to, we learn how to love one another through those difficult conversations. And then at the same time, talking to others, listening to others, being willing to, to hear their story, hearing what, what's going on in their lives, we can build other people up and we can encourage them. So this morning, we're going to listen to a few ancient conversations. And again, in John and Acts, the Acts of the Holy Spirit, and there are two books that we find side by side in our Bibles. So first we're going to go to John chapter 1. And Alicia DeVries is going to read for us. This is the day right after Jesus was baptized by John the Baptist. So that's what Alicia is going to read for us. Can you hear me? Okay. Yes. Uh, John 1, 35 to 42. The next day John the Baptist was there again with two of his disciples. When he saw Jesus passing by, he said, Look, the Lamb of God. When the two disciples heard him say this, they followed Jesus. Turning around, Jesus saw them following and asked, What do you want? They said, Rabbi, which means teacher, where are you staying? Come, he replied, and you will see. So they went and saw where he was staying, and they spent the day with him. It was about four in the afternoon. Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, who was one of the two, heard what Jesus had said, and who had followed Jesus. The first thing Andrew did was to find his brother Simon and tell him, we have found the Messiah, that is the Christ, and he brought him to Jesus. Thank you, Alicia. All right, so what was the first thing that Andrew did? Anybody remember? Just uh, yell it at the screen, or not yell maybe. What was the first thing Andrew did? He went and found Nathaniel, right? And he said to him, come and see. Come and see. Well, next we're going to go to John chapter 4. And we're not going to read that one this morning because uh, we went through John chapter 4 a few weeks ago. Uh, I spoke in that chapter, and then John Lusink, uh, our missionary, 
he spoke again on John chapter 4. And just as a reminder, Jesus had a, an interracial conversation with a woman about water. Water to drink, and then the water of life as well. And Jesus showed her how valuable she is to God, especially as a woman and as a person uh, that many people around her looked down upon. And Jesus often did that, didn't he? He highlighted his love for people that were on the margins, people that were outcasts, people that were refugees and immigrants. Jesus had a great respect and a love for everyone equally. And it's really important for us to remember that. All right, we're going to jump ahead to Acts. Uh, we're going to be in Acts chapter 3. Acts chapter 3, and uh, we're going to start in verse, um, I think it's verse 1. Uh, maybe, maybe it's another one, but the Reverend family. I think the Reverend girls are going to read for us. So Eliane and Ariella and Yannicka. One day, Peter and John were going up to the temple at the time of prayer, at three in the afternoon. Now a man who was lame from birth was, was being carried to the temple gate called Beautiful, where he was put every day to beg from those going into the temple courts. When he saw Peter and John about to enter, he asked them for money. Peter looked straight at him as did John. Then Peter said, look at us. So the man gave them his attention, expecting to get something from them. Then Peter said, silver or gold, I do not have, but what I do have, I give you. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, walk, taking him by the right hand, he helped him up, and instantly the man's feet and ankles became strong. Counted his feet and he began to walk. Awesome. Thank you so much, girls. You get, your girls did an excellent job. <laughs> so that's a, a real conversation that was a part of the early church right before, right after Jesus went back up into heaven. So what did the man ask Peter and John for? Do you remember? What did that man who was... Um, had been crippled and lame. What did what did he ask Jesus? What did he ask those men for? He asked them for money, right? Because he needed money so that he could buy food. What did Peter give him in Jesus' name? What did Peter give that man in Jesus' name? Now I want you to think about what does in Jesus' name mean? You might remember if you've seen old movies or read old books, you hear, in the name of Caesar, or in the name of the king. And that means in the authority of. And so when we say in Jesus' name, we mean because Jesus is the king, I am saying this in his name, by his authority. And we can do that. You can do that. You can pray for people in Jesus' name, in Jesus' authority. And it's really important for us, actually, as followers of Jesus to do that, to pray in his name. Uh, this week, uh, you, we might hear a story in a couple of weeks about one of the ladies in our church who went and prayed with someone in Jesus' name for a miracle uh, in their family's life. And you know what? God is doing some incredible things in that family. It's beautiful what, we can, what God has given us the privilege of praying in Jesus' authority. And it's not something that we can just, you know, oh, yeah, we might do that one day. Or, you know, as Baptists, we kind of maybe put that on the shelf a long time ago. We need to bring that off the shelf and put that back into our lives. One of the things that uh, Peter and John did was they saw that man. He was, they could have just walked by. They could have been like the, the hundreds, maybe even thousands of people going to prayer that day and, and over, the, over the years since he'd been lying there during his whole life and just walked, walked past him. But they saw him. And they were, they were willing to show him that God, that Jesus sees him too. And I want to encourage you and, and, and myself that we see people when we pass them by or when we uh, are having a conversation with them. All right, we're going to go to Acts chapter 8. 
Acts chapter 8, we're going to pick up in verse 26, and uh, Jordan McKay is going to read for us. All right, can you hear me? Yep. All right. Now an angel of the Lord said to Philip, Go south to the road, the desert road, that goes from Jerusalem to Gaza. So he started out, and on his way he met an Ethiopian eunuch, an important official in charge of all the treasury of the Kandaka, which means queen of the Ethiopians. This man had gone to Jerusalem to worship, and on his way home he was sitting in his chariot reading the book of Isaiah, the prophet. The spirit told Philip, Go to that chariot and stay near it. Then Philip ran up to the chariot and heard the man reading Isaiah the prophet. Do you understand what you're reading? Philip asked. How can I, he said, unless someone explains it to me. So he invited Philip to come up and sit with him. This is the passage of scripture the eunuch was reading. He was led like a sheep to the slaughter, and as a lamb before its shearer is silent, so he did not open his mouth. In his humiliation, he, deprived, he was deprived of justice. Who can speak of his descendants? For his life was taken from the earth. The eunuch asked Philip, Tell me, please, who is the prophet talking about, himself or someone else? Then Philip began with that very passage of scripture and told him the good news about Jesus. As they traveled along the road, they came to some water, and the eunuch said, Look, here is water. What can stand in the way of my being baptized? And he gave orders to stop the chariot. Then both Philip and the eunuch went down into the water, and Philip baptized him. When they came up out of the water, the Spirit of the Lord suddenly took Philip away, and the eunuch did not see him again, but went on his way rejoicing. Philip, however, appeared at Azotus and traveled about, preaching the gospel in all the towns until he reached Caesarea. Yeah, thank you, Jordan. So did you catch some of the things there in that story? Really easy for us if you've read that many, many times or heard it read to, to miss a few things there. Who did God send Philip to? He sent him to an Ethiopian, didn't he? And where is Ethiopia? If you don't know where it is, I'm not going to tell you. You need to find out where it is. Where is Ethiopia? God sent Philip to an Ethiopian to have a conversation with him to share the good news about Jesus. And this man, as far as we know, was the first Christian, was the first follow of Jesus from that continent. Isn't that incredible? That right away, right there in the first few years of, of, of the church, and I'll give it away, that we have someone who's following Jesus from Africa. It's beautiful. Now, this is the second story that we've looked at already, where God is reaching out to people from different cultures. God has a great love for everyone in the whole world equally. And he wants everyone from all tribes, all nations, all languages, all people groups to come to know him through Jesus. And he wants you, and he wants me, and he wants the person that's next to you, if you're with somebody, to build relationships and to have conversations with men and with women and with young people and with children from all, cult all cultures. And we need to remember this. Uh, living here in Nanaimo, I mean, today in 2020, when we moved here in uh, 2001, when Kelly and her family moved here back in the maybe late 70s, early 80s, um, this city looked a whole lot different, very homogenous. But today there's people from all over the planet that God has brought here. And one of the reasons is so that we can have a relationship with them and conversations and pray for them in Jesus' name. When they have um, a request, when something's going on in their life, maybe health-wise or financially or um, something that they're concerned about or have anxiety for, just say, you know what, can I pray for you? And that's an amazing opportunity. That's a big step. And so before that, you might be simply having conversations with them, building a friendship, letting them know that you care about them, uh, that you love them, and that you want to have a relationship with them. 
And, and when you sense God prompting you, to let them know that God wants to have a relationship with them too. All right, let's go to one, uh, another story in Acts chapter 16. Paul is with his companions. They've been traveling around. They're on a missionary journey. And I'm going to ask Paige Van Dopp if she would read this story for us. All right, can everyone hear me? Awesome. Uh, on the Sabbath, we went outside the city gate to the river, where we expected to find a place of prayer. We sat down and began to speak to the woman who had gathered there. One of those listening was a woman from the city of Thyatira named Lydia, a dealer in purple cloth. She was a worshiper of God. The Lord opened her heart to respond to Paul's message. When she and the members of her household were baptized, she invited us to her home. If you consider me a believer in the Lord, she said, come and stay at my house. And she persuaded us. Thank you, Paige. So a pretty short story, but there's a lot packed in there. So who was Lydia? What do we know about Lydia from this short part of the Bible? Well, we, we know what cities she was from, and we know that she was a prominent businesswoman. You weren't a dealer in pur purple cloth unless you were a prominent businesswoman. That was a, a very expensive trade at that time. And so Paul goes to this, Paul and his companions, probably Mark and maybe Luke and others, um, go to this place of prayer. And you'll notice that many of these passages are accompanied by prayer. Remember, Peter and John were going to the house of prayer, going to the temple to pray. Here, they're going down to the river to find a place of prayer. And it says that, where, where is this? I've totally lost it. It says, it says that she was a worshiper of God. She was a worshiper of God. So let me ask you a question. Can you worship God without knowing Jesus? Did she know Jesus yet? And yet it says she was a worshiper of God. So what does the Bible say? If you want to read later in Acts chapter 10, the story of Cornelius, it says that Cornelius was a God-fearer or a worshiper of God long before he came to know Jesus. That's important for us to remember. These are, these are conversations that, that, that people of Jesus, people of God, are having with other people and leading them to Jesus. That's how important conversations are. Friends, is it simply enough to be a Christian and to hope that other people see Jesus in you and, and just spontaneously erupt into a new believer? Sometimes we need to have conversations. All right, one more. One more from Acts chapter 16 starting in verse 25. And Tanya Blodorn, she's going to read for us. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay, excellent. Acts 16, 25 to 34. About midnight, Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns to God, and the other prisoners were listening to them. Suddenly, there was such a violent earthquake that the foundations of the prison were shaken. At once, all the prison doors flew open, and everyone's chains came loose. The jailer woke up, and when he saw the prison doors open, he drew his sword and was about to kill himself because he thought the prisoners had escaped. But Paul shouted, Don't harm yourself. We are all here. The jailer called for lights, rushed in, and fell trembling before Paul and Silas. He then brought them out and asked, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? They replied, Believe in the Lord Jesus, and you will be saved, you and your household. Then they spoke the word of the Lord to him and to all the others in his house. At that hour of the night, the jailer took them and washed their wounds. Then immediately he and his household were baptized. The jailer brought them into his house and set a meal before them. He was filled with joy because he had come to believe in God, he and his whole household. Thank you, Tanya. I want you to consider reading one or more of these stories again this afternoon or this evening or probably this afternoon or this evening or maybe sometime tomorrow. If you don't do it in the next 24 hours, it's not very likely that you will. But I want you to go back to one of these stories and see what is it that God is, wants to teach you from this story. If we go back through this one that we just read, Paul and Silas, they're in prison. They've been beaten. Their backs are shredded. Um, you know, they're in danger of getting infection. 
uh, they're in they're in a brutal place. There's probably rats and mice. Uh, if they fall asleep, they're in trouble. And so they're singing and they're praying and they're praising God. And God brings this earthquake and the prison doors are open and the shackles of all the guys in prison come off. And now we're in a life and de- death situation for the jailer. He knows that if this guy's es- these guys escape, he's done. And so he's in this life and death situation, and he's about to take his own life. And Paul intervenes. It says that he shouts, right? And they share the good news with him. He basically says, what do I have to do to be delivered? In that culture, saved meant delivered or rescued. What do I have to do? And so Paul makes it very clear to him that he needs to believe in the Lord Jesus and that he will be saved, him and his household. So he believes and all of his, all of his family and then they're baptized. It's a conversation that once again leads to Jesus. How do these happen? Well, in almost every, every case, the person who's having the conversation with the one who's lost has been praying. They've been praying. Remember, I've been asking you to pray for those five people and then waiting for God's guidance. Sometimes that's tough for us. Sometimes, I know for me, I just want to blurt out instead of waiting for God. But it's important to have that waiting time to pray and then wait for God's guidance and then act or share. So pray and watch and wait for God's time and then act. Some of you remember I talked about haircuts earlier. Anybody remember that? Thought I was going to get around to it maybe. So a friend of mine, a couple of weeks ago, or a little bit a while ago, had a prompting to share with his neighbor, and he first met this neighbor through having a haircut. Some of you are hoping to have a haircut soon. And and that's how he met this person. And God spoke to him through reading the Gospel of John. He was reading the the Gospel of John, and he was going through the story of the woman at the well, this Samaritan woman, this this interracial lady. And God said to him that he wanted him to say this to this lady, Jesus would go out of his way to meet you. Maybe you don't know that Jesus, it says that Jesus had to go through Samaria. In fact, most Jewish people went around Samaria. They didn't even want to go to that country. But it says Jesus had to go. Why? Because he wanted to meet this woman. And so, and so my friend said to this, God said to him, I want you to say, Jesus would go out of his way to meet you, and he would enjoy hanging out with you. And he wouldn't have heard that unless he had been spending time with God in prayer. And so he believed God told him that, and then he waited. Well, he didn't have to wait too long. That same lady came to borrow some garden tools, and he realized that this was his chance to pass along this message. And he said it felt weirdly risky. I don't know how weird it is. I feel like that was pretty risky, too. I'm going to give somebody a message from God? Whoa. But you know what? He delivered that message, and she glowed, and she smiled. And then she said, are you inviting me to church? And you know what he said? said, I'm not sure. I'm just delivering a message. And then she opened up and she started telling her story to him. And then he just shared with her about online church and how that's an option. And also if she would want to join a Bible study. And so she asked if she could think about that. And so I want to ask you to join with me in praying for for my friend. Uh, I'll just call him Jay, Jay period to pray for him uh, with his friend that she would be open to becoming, to joining a Bible study and maybe inviting some other friends of hers to, to read about Jesus. I may have mentioned that I heard another story about like that just a few days ago. Someone prompted uh, one of the people in our church to just go right now and pray for somebody, somebody who had a need. And sometimes we'll say, you know what? Yeah, I'll pray for you. I've said that to so many neighbors that are in trouble. Okay, I'll pray for you. But this, this, this person this week went to them and said, you know what, I need to pray for you right now. And so they prayed right then and there. Friends, that's how new disciples are made. 
That's how we grow as a disciple. When we're willing to break that sound barrier and, and, and have a brief prayer uh, with somebody. And then they start to become disciples even before they know Jesus because they're seeing God at work. All right, now's the time for your pen and your paper. Uh, maybe you've got a device where you can uh, make some notes on. Um, yeah, I really want to encourage you to write this down. Write, write these things down in the next couple minutes here. Do you have, or I'm going to put it this way, who are three to five people God would have you share with in the next little while? Who are three to five, five people that you think that you might think God would have you share with? And, and I hope you've been praying about that. I hope that you've already got some of those people. And if not, just send up a prayer to God right now. These people can be believers, fellow followers of Jesus, maybe someone that God uh, wants you to help build them up in their faith. But I want to encourage you to have at least two, even three, who you're pretty sure don't yet know Jesus. And just write their names down on that paper or uh, on your phone or device there. I'm just, I'm, uh, I'm just going to take the time to write down a couple of names myself. So go ahead and do that. And now I want us to take a few minutes to pray, just right now. So if you're with uh, somebody or a few people, uh, I want you to stop. And, and maybe it's just going to be silence, and that's okay. But if you feel like praying out loud, to pray for those people. And maybe it's just to pray for an opportunity. Maybe it's just to pray, God, what have you been teaching me recently that you would have me share with somebody else? And ask God to prompt you to share. Not that you would just go and do this kind of in your own strength, but, but that the Holy Spirit would lead you. And if you're by yourself, just between you and God, spend that time in prayer. And ask God who and what he would have you to say. So I'm going to literally set a timer on my phone for three minutes, and we're going to pray together. So let's pray. Keep in mind that Jesus said that God's house would be called a house of prayer. And right where you are right now is a house of prayer. So, um, Father, thank you for this opportunity to pray uh, together, even just separately uh, in our own homes, uh, in our own space. And um, for those that are outside, uh, God, it's uh, beautiful that we can share together. Thank you, God, that you know our names. Thank you that you know the names of the people that we were sharing with. God, that we, that we are asking you to share with. Your love is great. And would you give us the opportunity to share our faith with these people that are around us? And to be open to you sending us to others that we aren't even aware of right now. God, you are awe-inspiring, amazing, and a gracious God. We love you. Amen.